Okay, everybody. Um, we're going to continue. Our next speaker is uh, Zaza Kuchua, also from uh, Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. Uh, Zaza is an old friend of his organization, and he probably has invested uh, more time into the mouse business than any of us. Uh, uh, and um, he has also published the first paper on the mouse model. Zaza. Thank uh, organizers for inviting me here. I think it's a great meeting, and uh, I met lots of old friends and had opportunity to discuss many issues. Um, uh, as we know, mouse model became available about three years ago, and uh, we've been working on this uh, mouse model of tafazin deficiency. Uh, this is not conventional uh, knockout model. Gene is not deleted. A gene, is, gene function is suppressed through uh, RNA interference mechanism. So, therefore, it's inducible me uh, uh, model, so you can induce uh, gene knockout by giving them doxycycline or, take, uh, or restore gene function by taking it out. Um, but it's um, not tissue-specific, so all tissues get the same amount of shRNA. So... Uh, tafazin function is suppressed in all uh, tissues. I'll talk about a little bit about uh, cardiolipin and uh, phospholipids, Barth syndrome, and um, defects we saw in the mouse model. Uh, after this, we did, uh, we did some indirect calorimetry um, experiments on the mouse model, so I will talk about that. Um, we, uh, we did this on the basal resting conditions, and we stressed mice also. Uh, I'll talk about mitochondrial respiration, because mitochondria are the powerhouse, and they do produce ATP, and they consume oxygen, and we think that tafazin deficiency primarily affects um, mitochondrial function. And uh, uh, finally, I will um, talk a little bit about uh, interaction, physical interaction of um, fatty acid oxidation system with the mitochondrial oxfos system and the role of cardiolipin in this interaction. So this is a uh, slide shows uh, different cellular compartments and the mitochondrial membranes are the walls that define these compartments and uh, phospholipids are the building block of these uh, mitochondrial membranes. Um, here you can see the cardiolipin, which is unique for mitochondria, and no other uh, membranes contain this cardiolipin, and cardiolipin is deficient in Barth uh, syndrome, and we assume uh, it's natural to expect that uh, primary victims of this deficiency would be mitochondria. Uh, we, first, we went analyzed a few years ago um, uh, cardiolipin levels in uh, tafazin deficient mice. We saw the same pictures, uh, essentially same picture we see in the BART patients. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, Fred Vass in, uh, from Amsterdam. And uh, this is the uh, predominant form of cardiolipin, uh, tetralinoleal cardiolipin in uh, heart and skeletal muscle. And this cardiolipin is deficient in uh, tafazin knockout mice, which is red here. Blue is wild type. Um, that's exactly the same uh, picture we saw. Uh, we do see is published in the um, uh, samples from BART patients. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, deficiency causes uh, um, defects in the um, mitochondria and uh, in uh, cardiomyocytes in general. And this is uh, six month, uh, eight months old uh, mice, uh, tafazin knockout mice. You can see the all signs of uh, deficiency, uh, cardiac defects, it is EM study. And you can see the mitochondria here. Um, Myofibrils are in disarray also. And uh, we see with our uh, protocol of um, tafazin um, knockout, giving doxycycline, uh, we see these effects only about at six months of age, and after this it gets worse. But before that, we didn't see any signs, at least on the EM and the, with the echo, we didn't see any signs of 
cardiomyopathy in mice. And this is skeletal muscle, where we see defects much earlier. This is two months old. Uh, skeletal muscle, fast glycolytic muscle from two months old mice, and we do see these defects much earlier. And these is giant structures are dysfunctional mitochondria, either they go under mitophagy or this is the f um, result of um, abnormal uh, fusion of mitochondria. Uh, because of mitochondrial pro uh, defects, we decided to test mice uh, with indirect calorimetry to, to study physiology at resting conditions and uh, uh, during the uh, different ki kind of stress. In our case, we choose cold stress because we had experience with other uh, mouse models about cold and we know the cold can uh, um, unveil phenotypes. It's a physiological stress. And another stress we chose was the uh, treadmill. So this is uh, the machine we built. This is environmental chamber, which can uh, temperature can adjust for between 4 and 40 degrees. And these four metabolic chambers where mice are uh, housed, uh, they get air, equal flow, equal flow of air, and they, after this, uh, samples are taken from each uh, chamber and they analyze with CO2 and oxygen um, sensors and uh, calculate under the computer. And uh, we can adjust temperature here, as I said, but the mice are resting. In different set of experiments, we run mice on the treadmill. Uh, and uh, this is also airtight treadmill. And uh, uh, here we have a small electrical grill if mice fell from the uh, treadmill, from the belt, they receive mild electrical shock. They have to jump back. So this is a uh, forced exercise. Belt speed can be adjusted, uh, and uh, also inclination can be adjusted. So air sample is taken and analyzed with the computer. And here's how, how it actually looks. This is the environmental chamber uh, with metabolic chambers in, with individual mice. And this is the treadmill. And those are the machines that uh, analyze oxygen and the CO2. And the first we uh, did this calorimetry at resting conditions um, at room temperature. After this, we uh, lower temperature to plus 5 degrees in this chamber and did the readings. And the after this, we did calorimetry on this treadmill. So those are the several uh, metabolic parameters we, uh, we collected. Um, uh, oxygen concentration, this is the reference oxygen concentration and CO2 concentration, basically how much gets in and how much gets out. So with constant uh, air flow. And uh, oxygen consumption rate is calculated with these formulas, uh, CO2 production rate, uh, and respiratory exchange ratio, I'll talk a little bit uh, on the next slide, but this is ratio of these two uh, uh, parameters, and energy expenditure, or sometimes it was called heat, is calculated by this empirical formula. It's been published about 40 years ago. So respiratory exchange ratio basically shows which fuel is used uh, by the uh, organism. If we, uh, if we met metabolize, fully oxidize one molecule of glucose, we use six molecules of oxygen and we produce six molecules of CO2, so your respiration exchange ratio is one. But if fat is uh, oxidized, then we use 23 molecules of oxygen, produce 16 CO2s and it's 0.7. So basically by measuring the respiratory exchange RER, we can see, we can tell which is preferable fuel. Is it fat, carbohydrates, or mixed substrates like proteins? First, energy expenditure. We put mice on the uh, environmental chamber, and uh, uh, they, uh, they, um, they were like 12 hours during the day cycles, and after this, they will be switched to the night cycles, and this is the recording of the night cycle. You can see these uh, periodic waves, probably reflecting activity and resting periods of mice. Um, 
and this is tafazin knockouts. And uh, I want to stress these are two from two to three old my, or, or, uh, months old mice before the, any cardiac phenotype has shown up. Um, this is basically this is time. So time. So it, uh, samples are taken every minute and analyzed. So you can see this pattern is gone. Uh, although basic uh, overall uh, energy expenditure value wasn't much affected in these mice. Um, so now we are uh, trying to do the locomotor activity of these mice. Probably it will show more interesting results. But uh, this is um, data in, uh, from our mice. This is uh, energy expenditure. Uh, uh, normalized uh, per weight. And you can see this uh, at 22 degrees. They're different, but not very much. Um, but when we put them in cold, uh, energy expenditure in wild-type mice goes high, way high. And the knockout mice also goes high, but not as much as wild types. So it looks like uh, energy expenditure function is Impired. And uh, this is uh, fatty acid oxidation def deficient mice, VLCAT knockouts, we have in our lab, and they show the same kind of uh, deficiency when uh, placed in the cold. Although these two models uh, differ, uh, Barth uh, or Tafazin deficient mice can withstand cold for a prolonged time, about five hours. They were able to, we were able to keep them there. And when we take them out of the cold, they, uh, they cover fine and they uh, run. While uh, VLCAT knockout mice, they die pretty soon after uh, we put them in the cold. In about two hours, they are dead. Uh, and uh, these mice were, um, I forgot to mention, they were unfed 12 hours before we put them there. So they were hungry, but f fasted, but they had free access to water. So why it is happening? Because they cannot, uh, um, they cannot utilize the oxygen, and uh, as previous uh, yesterday uh, presentation showed, this is the case in human uh, bark patients as well. So they cannot uh, use as much oxygen uh, as wild types. <coughs> this is uh, oxygen consumption rate uh, at uh, 22 degrees and at plus five degrees. So this is cold stress. Uh, what happens on the treadmill when we stress in different kind of stress? This is the exercise stress. stress. Uh, basically, when we did the pilot experiments, the uh, toughest and deficient mice, uh, mice failed on this, and they felt from the uh, uh, treadmill. So if mice fell, uh, drop from the uh, belt and uh, they stay on the electrical grid for three, more, uh, three or more consecutive uh, seconds. We take them out of the uh, experiment and put on the cage back. So that's what happened with the toughest and deficient mice. When we put them in the treadmill and we start increasing speed gradually, they hold up for uh, some time and after this they felt thick and the and RER ratio, respiratory exchange ratio at this point was very high. Uh, while wild-type mice had not, well, they were struggling, but they could sustain this kind of uh, exercise quite a long time, about 35 minutes. Uh, and again, oxygen uh, consumption rate was uh, quite different in wild-type and knockout. So if you see, this is, we calculated oxygen consumption rates uh, in entire uh, period of time, so... This is what I'm showing here. Uh, this is tough as in knockout mice, and this is uh, wild type controls. So they cannot, probably they cannot extract as much oxygen from the uh, blood as wild types. Uh, this is uh, other RER uh, training. So uh, what we did after this, we chose this area to work on. So we didn't go uh, in extremely high exercise um, intensity. 
So we choose this area, which is um, which um, tough as in uh, deficient mice can uh, sustain. And um, uh, we run now now mice in this condition when they can uh, tough as both tough as in and wild type mice can run okay. So this is wild type mice, and you can see if, you, if we increase uh, speed of a treadmill, uh, RER values from 0.7, mostly fat, goes up to the carbohydrates. And at some point, we do see these uh, jumps in all uh, our wild-type mice. They look different, but we do see these um, jumps. And I, when I show these uh, pictures to the uh, uh, experts from the sports medicine, they say it looks like a second wind uh, phenomena, which is uh, shown to be in athletes when... Uh, uh, they run, and suddenly they have a drop in the uh, heart rate. Some say it's a fuel switch. Some say it's a, um, uh, effects of the endorphins. Uh, there's no consensus about this, but we do see this uh, in wild-type mice, and we don't see it in the uh, toughest in lockdown. So they do have a, this increasing uh, uh, increasing in area values uh, when intensity of exercise is increased. So this is intensity and this is RER values. And the three, three different subjects of uh, wild type and three different knockouts. And this is more detailed uh, picture. So this is exercise intensity dash lines. Uh, there are uh, knockouts, a red one, and the blue one is wild type. So you can, uh, you can see this. About 15 meters per minute this uh, switch uh, curves in wild types. And we measured lactate levels and these uh, glucose and lactate levels on this area when uh, we stopped exercise at peak of the exercise. And the glucose level wasn't much uh, affected, while lactate level was very, way high in the knockout mice, uh, telling us probably that uh, uh, partially, these mice rely on the anaerobic uh, metabolism when are switched to the uh, w when they are put in a high exercise conditions. So let me summarize a little bit at this part. So toughest and deficient mice demonstrate a normal rates of energy expenditure at basal resting condition. So we couldn't find big differences there, but when exposed or too cold energy expenditure of toughest and deficient mice is severely impaired compared to wild types due to limited ability to consume oxygen. And when subjected to moderate uh, intensity workload, toughest and deficient mice exhibit reduced rates of oxygen consumption and fail to adapt to high energy demands. And we uh, showed it on the, um, with the treadmill. So a natural question is to ask after this, how mitochondrial function is affected in toughest in mice? And uh, we uh, checked mitochondrial function in neonatal cardi uh, cardiac uh, myocytes. We isolated uh, mice, um, myocytes, cardiomyocytes from one day old uh, mice after, just after the birth and uh, cultured them in the uh, 24 well uh, dishes and uh, measured using um, seahorse uh, machine, uh, extra cell of flux analyzer, as they call it. Um, and this is oxygen consumption rate on uh, wild types. Again, blue and the toughest uh, are red. You can see that basal uh, uh, respiration are not different, the same. Uh, if you add oligomycin, which inhibits the complex uh, 5, you can uh, see the oligomycin in sensitive respiration is also not different. But uh, differences begin once you uh, uncouple respiration. So when you, um, when you measure the maximal oxygen consumption rate, so you can see after additional of uncoupl additional of uncoupler and uh, pyro weight, um, oxygen consumption rate goes way up in the wild type uh, cardiomyocytes and tough as in, uh, uh, deficient cardiomyocytes can only sustain about half of that uh, 
uh, ox uh, oxidation capacity, respiratory capacity. Although there was no difference between uh, glycolytic fluxes in these two uh, groups between wild type and knockouts. Um, now we, we did this on the one day old uh, mice, cardiomycites from these uh, one day old mice, and uh, we cultured them for several, uh, two or three days before we measured this uh, respiration. Now we're working on the protocol to further differentiate these cardiomyocytes uh, to, uh, with the beating phenotype and to stress them with, the, um, with different pharmacological agents like uh, uh, isoprotonol or similar. Uh, respiration can also be used to measure the oxidation of fatty acids in the cardiomyocytes, so in basically here if we are instead of oligomycin, we are the palmitate, we can uh, uh, stimulate the respiration uh, by fatty acid oxidation uh, pathway. And this is the, we are the palmitate BSA uh, complex. And you can see the fatty acid oxidation goes up in uh, wild type mice and fails to do in knockout mice. So that suggests that fatty acid oxidation may be impaired in, um, in tuffers in, uh, during tuffers deficiency. Now I have to stress this is not fatty acid oxidation, pure fatty acid oxidation measurement. This is how, uh, how uh, respiration that is uh, stimulated by fat. So it's, it's basically coupling between this fatty acid oxidation and the Oxford systems. Um, yeah, first, uh, we did, uh, because uh, of these uh, differences, we decided to do some limited prote proteomics analysis of mitochondria from wild type and uh, toughest in deficient uh, hearts. And uh, this is limited mitochondrial. The limited I'm uh, saying is because those are only uh, chosen from 170 most abundant uh, proteins uh, uh, in the mitochondria, soluble proteins, 170, when we know that um, total proteome of uh, mitochondria is uh, well above 1,000 different polypeptides. Uh, but we are working uh, to analyze more data, but at, uh, from the, this first glimpse, uh, several uh, interesting uh, candidates came out so this is trifunctional protein subunit beta, uh, and I will talk about uh, trifunctional protein uh, later. And uh, we, we saw also uh, an electron transport chain and metabolism uh, uh, enzymes. Some structural proteins also, uh, which is interesting because we do see this uh, 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 we do see the def def defects in the uh, sar sarcomers as well, not only mitochondria, so probably those reflect the initial stage of the uh, deficiency because these mitochondria, again, were isolated well before the uh, cardiac phenotype was uh, visible uh, in, the two, uh, in two months old mice. Protein sorting and degradation machinery and the calcium homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, we also saw that uh, we, in the literature, evidence that oxidative phosphorylation and the fatty acid oxidation system can physically interact in mitochondria. Uh, and this uh, paper was uh, from Dr. Kitt's lab, and uh, we, hypo we just hypothesized, is the cardiolipin is required for physical association of fatty acid oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation system? Because we know that cardiolipin is required to assembly of the mitochondrial oxfos super complexes. So maybe the same mechanism works uh, for fatty acid oxidation. And uh, this is fatty acid oxidation spiral. It makes sense uh, association with complex one, for example, or complex three, because this is a spiral where dehydrogenation uh, happens first step, and after this trifunctional protein uh, catalyzed uh, these uh, three reactions. And uh, uh, in, uh, this, uh, in this spiral, um, reducing equivalents are produced, 
which are uh, feeding oxidative phosphorylation system to make ATP. And uh, there's two entry points uh, for in the oxidative phosphorylation system is complex three. Uh, and uh, there's a complex one where NADH is produced here and it's a substrate for complex one. Uh, so we check this interaction, if this interaction is uh, really happening, at, if it's um, cardiolipin is required for this interaction. Uh, this is uh, native electrophoresis, two-dimensional native electrophoresis. It's a good way to check protein-protein uh, interaction. First, mitochondrial, uh, mitochondria isolated from cardiac muscle was were solubilized with very mild detergent and uh, separated on, on the native gel. You can see this separation here. Those are uh, en as enzymatic staining for complex one activity on this gel because uh, complexes are active. And you can see the complex one gives the several different uh, uh, bands here. Uh, this is wild type, this is knockout. And this, for example, this band is missing in the knockout. So we put these uh, strips of the gel on top of the denaturing gel in around second dimensions and uh, uh, bloated and developed bloats with the trifunctional protein antibodies. And this is l chat antibodies, alpha subunit for trifunctional protein. So this is wild type, it's knockout. You can see this band is missing exactly under this uh, missing band in the enzymogram of complex one. When we did the uh, uh, beta subunit uh, blood, we also saw several bands missing here. And um, mm, after this, we decided to see directly in the complex one. So we solubilize again mitochondrial complexes and we run on the gradient centrifugation uh, and we choose the fraction that was most uh, enriched with complex one. And we used um, antibodies to one of the complex one uh, complexes. And you can see this uh, highly enriched, while L-chat uh, uh, is not present. It's very low in the complex one in toughest deficient mice. So basically it shows that uh, complex one is deficient of L-chat. It's not interacting in toughest deficient mice. So I'll stop here. I just want to summarize this under stress conditions. Energy expenditure is severely limited in toughest deficient uh, mice have showed with uh, indirect calorimetry. Um, toughest deficiency results in significant reduction of maximal mitochondrial oxygen consumption. Uh, we showed it with a seahorse machine with respiration. Oxidative, uh, oxidation of fatty acids is impaired. Uh, we also see the, the, uh, when we had palmitate and that toughest and deficient mitochondria physically interact with complex one and TFP is destabilized. Uh, so its interaction is uh, destabilized and evidence suggests that cardiolipin is required for uh, TFP and uh, interaction with uh, ETC complex one. And I want to just acknowledge these people who work, uh, uh, work with me. Corey did the uh, all, um, calorimetry stuff. Uh, Ken Grace and did the proteomic studies and I want to acknowledge Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, which is a terrific place to work and do all kinds of this research, Bart Foundation and NIH. And I'm showing this Lego because I think the cardiolipin is that uh, base to build many mitochondrial and superstructures. And uh, if you have this base, then your structure is strong. Uh, and uh, like mitochondrial complexes and complexes with, my, uh, with uh, ox oxidative phosphorylation system and uh, uh, fatty acid oxidation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Zaza. We have time for maybe one question. Uh, Zaza, really nice uh, data you showed. Um, concerning this, this effect that palmitate that doesn't seem to be oxidized uh, once more. That, uh, uh, compares to what uh, Todd was showing yesterday. Have you done any additional fatty acids like uh, octanoate? You know, octanoate can in can go in, um, not fight the carnitine system, but it can get straight into the mitochondria, and then you know that would be an easy way to find out whether it is the, the CPT system, for instance, or whether it's truly the the, the beta oxidation system per se. 
because that, that's something which comes out so nicely from your work now and yesterday from Todd. I think you should do that, actually. Yeah, I think we should do that. Uh, that's, I'm not saying this only uh, complex one and the uh, oxidative phosphorylation explains this uh, deficiency. It can be transport of fatty acids because those are cardiomyocytes. Uh, and the, any step can be deficient. Zaza, that's very beautiful question, uh, very beautiful data. Now, I'm puzzled by the, um, the um, oligomycin uh, inhibition one. When you treated uh, the isolated cardiomyocyte with uh, oligomycin, did you include any substrate? Because what I want to see is whether the um, isolated cardiomyocyte from the tapasin deficient mice are leaky, the mitochondrial membrane leaky. That's the only way you can analyze it is by, uh, you know, give uh, oligomycin or, um, you know, other reagent in, in the presence of uh, substrate. Well, my, uh, cardiomyocytes were, uh, f uh, were uh, cultured in high glucose conditions, uh, but just before the uh, experiment, glucose was removed uh, one hour before to equilibrate with the respiration media. So uh, that's all the substrate we had. Uh, but cardiomyocyte is able to meet all the substrates uh, in the... Cycles. One quick comment. Yes. It, the, the boys that we see, we know there's no um, actual functional deficiency of, of LCHAD because the acyl carnitine profile is normal. However, I've twice seen a classic LCHAD organic aciduria in the newborn period. Unfortunately, I'm dating myself, it was before acyl carnitine was readily uh, uh, available, so I don't know if that time they did manifest, but it was quite striking uh, that it looked, that, that was what was considered the diagnosis at first in one of the boys. Okay, Zaza, thank you very much. We need to try to stay uh, within our time frame.